Okay, let's next turn to the other famous, and I will consider this at greater length, the other famous part of the book, namely, is it better to be feared than loved, right? Certainly the most famous chapter of the text, perhaps one of the most famous chapters uh, ever written in any book. You'll find it at chapter 18, which is entitled Cruelty and Mercifulness, and whether it is better to be loved or feared. Okay, let's read some of the critical parts of this chapter together. He says, If a ruler can keep his subjects united and loyal, he should not worry about incurring a reputation for cruelty. For by punishing a very few, he will really be more merciful than those who overindulgently permit disorders to develop with resultant killings and plunderings. Essentially, this ties into the previous discussion. If you're cruel to a few... But as a result of that cruelty, people stay in line, people behave well, people obey the law. Are you not actually achieving a greater good, right? For by punishing a few, he will really be more merciful than those who overindulgently permit disorders to develop with resultant killings and plunders. Maintaining order in society by punishing a few is better than having to end up punishing many because you've allowed disorder to develop. For the latter, namely disorder, usually harm a whole community, whereas the executions ordered by a ruler harm only specific individuals, right? In other words, it's this old, age-old question of how do, we, uh, how do we balance the problems of the collective good versus the individual good? You probably know the famous uh, trolley example, right, where you've got the people on the trolley and the person tied to the track. Do you know that, you know that case, right? No, really? Well, look it up. Anyway, it's the question is, you know, do you save the person on the trolley or do you save the people on the track? And it's the question of how do we then balance our concerns for our, the, what we owe to an individual uh, moral vision versus what do we owe to a collective moral vision? Which is greater? Is it okay to commit, to, to, to commit cruelty against a few so that the many may benefit, right? That's the kind of idea. Would you kill one person to save a hundred, for example, right? This is the kind of question. In fact, if you think about it, we're sort of seeing that same question right now because right at the moment off the coast of Japan in the city of Yokohama, there's a big boat full of 3,000 old people, right, basically, who took a cruise thinking it was going to be a nice experience. And then what happened to them? Corona. Someone got the coronavirus and now basically they are what? In a floating jail, right? And they're not allowed to leave their room. I mean, it's horrendous. So there they are. They're stuck Right? And because of who they are, mostly I think they're almost like 70% of them are over 60, and I think 10% are over 90. So they are at the highest risk for mortality of that disease. Why are they being quarantined? To save the rest. To protect society, right? Lest they spread the disease to a larger number of people. Even though by being quarantined, their chances of catching a disease that could very well end up uh, ending their lives prematurely increases very significantly, right? That's an example of the kind of Machiavellian power dynamic. You commit cruelty to a few in order that the, benef- the larger number may, may benefit. And so if you're a 60 or 70 year old person sitting on a boat locked in a cabin waiting for the coronavirus to come and get you, right? You're not feeling that the world is very just. On the other hand, if you're a Japanese mother looking at her children, are you happy that that boat is quarantined? Yes. Of course you are, because you benefit then from actions that serve the collective or the common good. So that's a classic example of what Machiavelli wants to tell us. Note that for Machiavelli, there's not even a question, right? He's not even, to him, this is not a matter that should even concern us. We shouldn't waste any time thinking about this. If I have to hang that guy up in the town, in the town square to show everybody else that they better fall into line or I'm going to fuck with them, then you should do it. And you shouldn't even think about it, right? That's the good thing to do. That is well-committed cruelty. However, he says, um, in continuing on this discussion, he says, a controversy has arisen about whether it is better to be loved than feared or vice versa. My view is that it is desirable to be both loved and feared. But is that realistic? Who are the only people who both love and fear you? Your, exact, your children, well, you're from the other perspective, right? The only people you've ever loved and feared in your life were your parents. And how old were you before you stopped fearing them? 11, 12, right? This is it. So it doesn't last very long, right? That's the problem. So unless you happen to be ruling in some kingdom of pre-adolescence, it's not going to work. 
It's not going to work because people turn 12 and then the fear factor is gone. And does love keep your adolescent in line? Was your love for your parents enough to stop you from doing bad things? No. So therefore, love's not going to work. What are we going to need then? It is much safer, as he says, to be feared than loved, right? So therefore, we have to figure out how to cultivate an effective form of fear. What's the problem for Machiavelli in deploying fear as a tool of power? And the problem is that there is a fine line between making people afraid of you and making people uh, resent you, right? In other words, that difference between fear but respect descending then into outright tyranny and rebellion. So you need to make, you need to find a policy that allows people to generate that sense of fear without at the same time fearing you so much that it turns into outright resentment and therefore, uh, therefore they will lose their sense of, uh, they lose their sense of respect and loyalty to you. And he says, in this case, right, how should we guide our policies of fear? And here we have a kind of Machiavellian psychology. Effective rule, right, so an effective rule of fear is one that is deployed within the context of the priorities of the self-interested or greedy citizen, right? In other words, you should deploy policies that are aware of or are sensitive to how people think and how people behave and how people have, the, the preferences that people have. He says, for example, at the bottom, uh, or for the, the bottom of the next paragraph, he says, Above all, the ruler must not touch the property of others. In other words, don't seize other people's property. That's not a good instrument of fear, simply confiscating their goods. And why? Because, he says, men forget sooner the killing of their own fathers than the loss of their patrimony, right? Kill their parents, that's okay. If they were dissonance, the old man deserved it, didn't like him that much anyway. Take away my land, and I have turned you into an enemy for life, right? Now I've given you an incentive to rise up against me. Now, we may not agree with Machiavelli that, in fact, committing violence against the father is greater than committing violence against, the pro against property, but the point about it is he's situating then this policy of fear in the context, right, of the psychology of the rule. You want to be sensitive to how people's priorities and preferences are actually shaped. He said, it is possible to be feared without incurring hatred. That's the line you want to walk. You want, make, you want to have people who are afraid of you, but don't hate you. And this can always be achieved if you refrain from laying hands on the property of the citizens and subjects and on their women folk, right? So don't take away their property and don't rape their women, right? Basically, this is your bottom, this is the kind of basic guideline. If it is necessary to execute anyone, this should be done only if there is proper justification and for obvious reasons. Don't practice random acts of cruelty. Respect people's property, respect their livelihoods, and respect their lives, uh, and then you will not fall into this uh, realm of being hated. The cruelty that you exercise should be visible, should be done in a way as to have, as he says, minimum impact as quickly as possible, but the purpose of that then is that it remains part of people's memories and therefore they will respect you because they fear you, they're afraid of you. They remember the time that you did such and such and so forth, but know where to draw the line. If you do not draw the line effectively and you fall from fear into hatred, once people hate you, now you've given them incentive to rise up against you, right? He captures this idea a little bit about how to deploy force around this line by using the analogy of two animals, the lion and the fox, exactly. And what do we associate with each of those animals? The lion we associate with? Strength, courage, and the fox we associate with? Cunning, Cunning sagacity, wisdom, and so on. And so for Machiavelli, the, the good ruler needs to be a combination of both. They need to be both cunning and strong, right? This is part of the virtu of, uh, of the ruler. He says, um, uh, he says in chapter 18 and on how rulers should keep their, uh, keep their promises, he says the ruler should imitate both the fox and the lion, right? For the lion is liable to be trapped, whereas the fox cannot ward off wolves. So therefore, you need to avoid the traps like the fox, but you also need to be able to, to fend off your enemies like the lion. There are two ways of contending, he says, for those who have power. One is by using laws, and the other is force. The first is appropriate for men, the second for animals. Right, we got that? 
So laws are appropriate for men. Force is appropriate for animals. So therefore, a ruler of men, should they be using laws or force? Laws, right? He says the former, namely laws, is often ineffective. One must therefore know how to have recourse to the latter. What's another way of saying that? Men are often mere animals. We often behave like animals. And so if you recognize who we truly are in our nature, therefore, instead of relying on laws, you must also be aware you sometimes have to rely on force. And so a good ruler will be able to cultivate those. In a way, that dynamic between a world of law and a world of force correlates then to this world of the fox and the world of the of the lion. A ruler must know well how to imitate beasts as well as employing properly human means because this is how people are. We will act uh, as much as like animals as we will like men. Therefore, he says, as a result of this reality that people, that this is the reality of how people behave, he says, a prudent ruler cannot keep his word, nor should he, when such fidelity would damage him and when the reasons that made him promise are no longer relevant. This advice would not be sound if all men were upright, but because men are treacherous and will not keep their promises to you, you should not consider yourself bound to keep your promises to them. Men are greedy and deceitful and self-interested, and because others will break their promise to you, you therefore have every right to break your promise to them. The interesting thing here is that you will note that the character of the ruler does not aspire to be any better than the character of the ruler. That to be a good prince is not to rise above the flaws of other people. To be a good prince is to recognize and get inside the flaws of other people. The role of the leader is not to inspire people to become, as he puts it, upright men. The role of the leader is to hang on to power in the context of people who are not upright. And so therefore, in that context, doing things like being willing to break your word is a necessary part of the craft of rule. He says, plausible reasons can always be found for such failures to keep promises, as I think we would agree with our current politicians. Do our current politicians break their promises to us? Do they always have an excuse? See, very Machiavellian. You can always find a good reason not to do the thing you said you were going to do. But your this cunning should be concealed. And he says, men are so naive and so much dominated by immediate needs that a skillful deceiver will find plenty of people who will let themselves be deceived. If you know how to lie uh, cleverly and carefully, you will find that people are more than happy to accept those lies. I don't know if that sounds right to you, but generally speaking, we get lied to all the time, right? Political promises made, political promises not kept. And how often do we tear down governments in a fit of rage? And the answer is hardly ever because we can be bought off with appeal to our immediate gratification, right? Foxiness should be well concealed. This is at page 62. One must be a great feigner and dissembler. One should learn how to lie well. You need to have a good poker face so that when you're lying to people's face, nonetheless, you come across as very sincere. And it's that element of the, necess the necessity to project sincerity, even as one of the core arts of rule is dissembling, deceit, treachery, and lying, that I think explains one of the most remarkable parts of his book, which are the qualities that, an imp that a ruler should cultivate. And he specifies a number. He specifies that they should be seen as exceptionally merciful, trustworthy, upright, humane, and devout. Is it important that a ruler be merciful, trustworthy, upright, humane, and devout? Is that a good thing for a ruler to be in Machiavelli's scheme? No. no. If a person who has those characteristics is unlikely ever to attain power, and if he or she does by accident, won't be able to hold on to it, because none of those qualities are consistent with the kinds of things that you need to do to exercise effective authority. The important thing, therefore, is not that you are those things. The important thing is that people think that you are those things, right? Appearances are what matters. And so, therefore, it's important that you cultivate a public persona that makes people believe that you are merciful, trustworthy, upright, humane, and devout. Of those, which characteristic does he say is the most important? I want to dwell on this for a moment here. Merciful, trustworthy, upright, humane, and devout. Which of those is the most important? Merciful. No. Trustworthy? 
No. <laughs> okay, random guessing time is over. The answer is devout. He says, and it is most necessary of all to seem devout. This is very interesting. Why would that quality, why devout devotion? What does it mean to, to, to be devout? What would we say? Violent. No. It means to have unusually passionate attachment to your faith. Yes? I was going to say that it's funny that in the Apology by Socrates, by Plato, and Socrates, the thing that he says is that he doesn't want to be a sophist and that he doesn't want to trick people with his word. And this is exactly the opposite of what Machiavelli is saying here, that, that rules should um, lie, basically. That's true, but if you think about it, there's a lot of consistency there because the purpose of the sophists was to go around and use their skills to teach men of the upper class how to speak well precisely so that they could convince people of their sincerity when they were insincere. And one of the things that, that we get from Socrates is that to be a politician is incompatible with being what? Just, right? Politics is the art of injustice in that sense. In a way, Machiavelli is completely in agreement with Socrates Except instead of seeing it as a problem, he's like, you know, the water's warm, come on in, right? That's the sense. So yes, there is, that, there is that idea, and I think that, in fact, he would probably acknowledge the important role that a sophist can play. If, if you can find someone to teach you how to appear to be what you are not, that's money well spent, right? That's a, a skill well acquired.